Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Tara Littleton, Workplace Experience Manager here at BICO, and we are super excited to have Jill Edwards with us today. I know we are all eager to hear how nutrition affects the aging process, and at least for me and those over the half century mark, would love to learn those secrets and figure out how to slow the aging process down real quick. <laughs> Jill is a certified clinical exercise physiologist, physiologist, sorry, and has a certificate in plant-based nutrition. So, and um, we're going to turn it over to her, but if you have any questions, you can place in our Q&A or chat and we will get to them as quickly as possible. So without further ado, um, let's turn it over to Jill so we can get started. Jill? Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Again, I'm Jill Edwards. I'm a director of education for a nonprofit nutrition research and education company called Center for Nutrition Studies and have done a lot of research for our online learning courses on longevity, the aging process, and what helps, of course, to delay that process. So our presentation today will cover a little bit of everything as it relates to uh, longevity, not just living longer, but living better. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And then Tara, I'm just gonna ask you and making sure that you can see my screen before yes. I begin. Yes, ma'am, I can see your screen. Great. So our life expectancy in the US has gotten better in the last century, You know, practically doubled a little bit more from 43 to the age of 78. So we are living longer than we used to, but are we aging well? If you look at healthcare costs per capita, the US is the most um, by a significant number. But even though we're spending the most in healthcare, our life expectancy from birth is still pretty bad when we compare ourselves to other developed countries. So right now the best is Japan um, and we're towards the bottom there. So again, even though that we've more than doubled our age expect our life expectancy in the last century, we're by no means better off as we compare ourselves globally. Our infant uh, mortality is also not fantastic. Our quality of primary care as it relates to more chronic disease management, such as asthma and diabetes, not fantastic. Again, as we compare ourselves to the rest of the world and our quality of acute care, um, safety during childbirth, heart, heart attack mortality, again, um, not fantastic as we compare ourselves to the rest of the world. So centenarians. So in 2020, it's estimated that about 90 thousand Americans will reach their 100th birthday. And that may sound like a lot, but that's very little percentage of the population. So what are they doing that the average American is not doing? The biggest thing is lifestyle. So we focus a lot on genetics as it pertains to longevity, but genes aren't necessarily our destiny. So about 70% of longevity and aging is lifestyle related, which is fantastic news. Um, again, that means we are not enslaved to our genes, that we do have some control over again, how well we age and how long we will be around. If uh, anyone has heard of the blue zones, those are pockets of the world. They're kind of like longevity hotspots. Um, again, areas in the world where people commonly live very active lives past the age of 100. And uh, the classification of these pockets has been really unique in that they all share patterns. And that's what we're gonna talk a little bit um, in more detail today. Number one, the biggest thing that uh, these blue zones do is they move naturally. So they're not necessarily taking a Zumba class or running marathons or joining gyms. But what they're doing is they're kind of building movement into their natural lifestyle. So they're taking stairs, not elevators. Um, they're walking everywhere. They're gardening, biking. Uh, I've tried to replicate that, and you may see me shifting back and forth just a bit. I have a bike underneath my desk, and from working at home and having more of a, a sedentary job, I find that this helps me um, with this particular pattern of, uh, of a of lifestyle pattern that's advantageous to folks that live long and that's moving naturally. So I may not be biking hard, uh, like in a spin or cycle class, but I'm constantly moving all day long as I'm um, sedentary at my desk. 
the right outlook. This is so important for our longevity and aging well. And we can kind of break that down into two different categories. Number one is stress. You know, even people in the blue zones experience stress. And the problem with this is that stress leads to chronic inflammation associated with pretty much every major related disease as it pertains to aging. So blue zones, again, what sets them apart from um, the average global uh, citizen is that they take time out of their day to actually have routines um, to shed that stress. So the Okinawans, they take a few minutes each day to remember their ancestors in a ritual. Um, Adventists pray, and we'll talk about each of these into, um, populations in a little bit more detail. Uh, Akarians take a nap, doesn't that sound nice? And Sardinians do a happy hour, but their happy hour is actually three hours long. Uh, and again, the happy hour that they're doing is not you know, all about wine and beer. Um, it's about gathering with friends and family and uh, really devoting time to uh, pleasure as opposed to working. The other thing that's really important with having the right outlook is having a sense of purpose. This is extremely important. And this is the problem we see that when a lot of folks retire, uh, they no longer have that sense of purpose. And you can see uh, oftentimes that when folks retire and they don't have another goal, um, another reason to get up in the morning, they often decline in physical and mental health very quickly. Unfortunately, I've seen this with my parents and also with my in-laws in a very significant way. Uh, and again, this is something that also sets the blue zones apart is for their aging population, they know their sense of purpose and it's something that it does extend their life expectancy. Up to about seven years is what we're finding from the research. The right tribe, everyone needs the right group to hang out with. And the folks again that live the longest, they choose social circles that actually support healthy behaviors. You may have heard that you're the product of the five people you spend the most time with. And that is very true, both from a research standpoint, but also anecdotally from, again, the observation of these patterns of blue zones. So Okinawans actually create uh, mohanis, which are groups of five friends that are committed to each other for life. So again, we can't always pick our family, but we can pick our friends. And so it's very important to pick people that inspire you, that um, help you to be your best self, and that support your health endeavors. You know, sometimes we can get in relationships where we're codependent or we tend to push each other's bad habits and that can be very dangerous long-term. Uh, research from the Framingham studies in particular, a very long-term uh, epidemiological study shows that things like smoking, obesity, happiness, and even loneliness are very contagious. As it pertains to obesity alone, your chance of being obese doubles when you have one friend that is obese. And what's even more staggering, it doesn't have to be necessarily a first degree friend. A friend of a friend who is obese even puts you at higher risk for obese. So again, it's just, uh, again, proving that we are the product of the people that we surround ourselves with. So always surrounding ourselves with the right tribe is advantageous. Eat wisely, and this is what most of our presentation is gonna be about today, because this tends to have the biggest bearing on longevity and aging well. So the cornerstone of most of these blue zones, their diets consist beans, that's something they, and legumes, that's something they all have in common, and vegetables and fruits. So again, I don't think that's any big surprise. We all know that these plant-based foods are um, extremely advantageous for overall health. And eating more of a plant-strong diet is the single most important thing each of us can do to prevent or delay um, the onset of disease as we age. And this is what we're gonna um, unfold a little bit in terms of the mechanisms and what the blue zones are doing. So America's blue zone, we do have one. And, and that is an area in Loma Linda, California, uh, the Seventh-day Adventists. And they live about a decade longer than the rest of Americans. So much of their longevity can be attributed to their vegetarianism. Um, so if you look at their diet, you know, a lot of it is going to be built around vegetables, fruit, and legumes, just like most of the other blue zones. Um, very little dairy, some whole grains, most of those whole grains coming from oats. 
uh, just a little bit of meat equivalent to one serving um, every 10 days and one serving being about the size of a deck of cards. Um, so very different than the average American and nuts and seeds and not a lot of processed food, which would translate to added fats and sugars, very little fish and very little eggs. So what is it about these foods that either speed up or slow down aging? So let's get a little bit more sciencey. So there's something that's called an advanced glycation end product, um, shortened to ages, uh, and it's a glycotoxin, toxin, excuse me. And these really accelerate the aging process. So the foods that are high in these ages include poultry is number one, pork, seafood, and beef. They have the most concentrated sources. If you look here in a chart, the biggest source of ages would be the skin um, or even the back or the thigh, chicken thighs. Uh, bacon is really high in ages. Uh, a hot dog, like a beef frankfurter. And then again, more with chicken and beef and continuing on. Again, these foods are extremely high in these glycotoxins. And the other caveat to that as well is when you're cooking these foods at high temperatures, that leads to other um, issues around organic acids and other toxins that can be even worse for the aging process. And the problem with this is what ages does. It ages us. Um, it causes tissue stiffness, oxidative stress, and a lot of inflammation in the body. So how that translates in organ systems is in the brain that contributes to cognitive disorders such as dementia, dementia, excuse me, and early onset Alzheimer's. In the eyes, cataract and macular degeneration. And in the arteries, this presents as hypertension, atherosclerosis, or the, or the blockage of arteries, heart failure, and stroke. And this also, other diseases would be anemia, which you wouldn't think because you would think, gosh, with more meat, I think that I wouldn't have anemia. And that's actually counterintuitive. Um, kidney disease is really rampant when we consume um, these high ages food. Osteoporosis. In the countries that consume the most meat and dairy, they have the highest percentage of osteoporosis compared globally. Type 2 diabetes is also attributed to this. And then overall muscle loss, which is an issue as we age uh, in general, but we can, again, help to delay or even reverse some of that muscle loss um, by what we're consuming, by what's on the end of our fork. Another mechanism of how food um, can age us is there's a component called um, methionine. And consuming less of this is linked to a slower rate of aging. So there's three different ways that we can lower our methionine intake. Number one is calorie restriction and fasting. And intermittent fasting has become extremely popular. And this is centuries old. Um, this is done in religious practices. This is done in other spiritual practices. And again, now it's more mainstream as a way to help combat inflammation and weight loss. And there's actually a lot of validity, validity of this. And this would be one of the reasons why is that when we actually um, fast, there is a lot of repair that goes on in the body because the body is not spending its resources to digest food. Um, so again, we're not going to get too much into this, but gosh, this I have um, a whole one hour lecture um, devoted to intermittent fasting. So just wanted to touch on that a little bit. The other way that we can consume less methionine is protein restriction. So in America, we sort of have a, a protein addiction. Um, everyone's always concerned about how much protein they're getting. But what we really should be concerned about is how much fiber that we're getting. We're very fiber deficient. Uh, there's extremely rare, if no cases, of protein deficiency. You figure our closest relative, um, the ape, um, the most of, if not all of their diet consists of leafy greens and bananas. And they are, I think no one can argue, very strong animals with a very high muscle mass. Not that we should be living on leafy greens and bananas, um, but we just don't need that much protein, about eight to 10% of our total calories needs to come from protein. So when we're consuming that sort of ideal amount, that's when we're getting just that right amount of methionine since it's an amino acid. The other way that we can decrease 
Um, that methionine, again, with slowing the aging process, is eating mostly plants or a plant-forward diet since they're extremely low in it. This just gives you a depiction of the amounts that are in certain foods. So over here is you know, an apple, for an example, and some nuts, um, some carrots, some bread, some beans, and then going on to some of the higher um, foods. And so over here, that's a canned tuna being the highest, um, some eggs, and uh, beef, chicken, and dairy. So higher amounts of methionine are located in those types of foods. So what about the immune system? Of course, in 2020, we know that the immune system has um, come to the forefront of discussion. The immune system, uh, in terms of Google Trends for 2020, was one of the top five searches. So, you know, and, and one of the most recognized consequences of aging is a decline in our immune system. So those most at risk of contracting respiratory viruses such as COVID are those with compromised or weakened immune responses. So our immune system is best prepared to take action against viruses when we actually have a lot of nutrients going through our system. And so these nutrients actually help to ward off um, the virus, but also help our bodies to attack that virus in a um, systematic way. So one of the things is something that's called the natural killer activity in diets that can have a lot of plants um, with them. Uh, that's something that they help to stimulate our natural killer cell activity. So they're a part of the immune response. Uh, they target pathogens and include viruses that are responsible for common respiratory infections. So again, just another reason to um, give our body the proper fuel is um, just to really boost our immune system. So can we measure aging? We can. There's something that's called telomeres. So we have about 46 strands of DNA in each of our cells and they're coiled into little tiny chromosomes. So at the tip of that chromosome, at the very end of that strand, there's a cap that keeps that DNA from unraveling and that's called a telomere. So every time that our cells divide, a bit of that cap is lost. And when it's gone, the cell, the cell stops dividing and it essentially dies. So telomeres start shortening as soon as we're born. And then when they're gone, so are we. So it sort of is the measurement of the aging process. So how do we slow down telomere shortening? Well, number one is, is smoking, um, cigarette smoking. So nicotine has been shown to significantly shorten our telomeres. And so that's something that um, you, know, you can reverse, it takes time. So if you were a smoker and you stop, that is something that you can kind of help to boost your telomeres, but there has to be a lot done in conjunction with diet to do that. So yes, can diet speed up or slow down aging? Absolutely, and we're gonna take a look at a big research study as it pertains to that. So in 1990, there's a cardiologist by the name of Dr. Dean Ornish, and he really became famous uh, for demonstrating that a plant-based diet can not only halt, but that could also reverse blockages in cardiac patients. So my background before I started working for the Center for Nutrition Studies is I worked for eight years in cardiac rehab. So I worked with patients that had stents, heart attacks, heart failure, um, open heart surgery for bypass, valve replacements. And we actually had the hospital that I worked at in Florida, we actually, uh, Medicare pays for it. And it's called the Ornish, Ornish Cardiac Rehab Reversal Program. And what we saw with those patients who, number one, switched to a plant-based diet, managed their stress and exercise, is we actually saw reversal and blockages. And it was so cool to see the cardiologist, you know, the shock and dismay, you know, that a, a simple lifestyle change could actually reverse the disease. So we had patients that had stents that were told that, you know, down the line, they were gonna get worse and they were gonna have to eventually need bypass, that they were able to prevent that. You know, unfortunately, the patients that didn't adhere, they tended to get worse and those blockages tended to, um, you know, increase as time went on. Same thing with heart failure patients. So what he did is he took that program and he applied it to an aging study. 
So in 2013, uh, he studied a, a bunch of folks, again, taking sort of that same pattern um, and testing the telomere length in humans. Um, this is just one of his latest books where he talks about the aging studies. Um, so I just put it here for your reference. And then at the bottom is the reference to the actual study. So in looking at the population in the research, the Ornish diet group, their telomeres got longer. So not only were they able to sort of um, delay the shortening, they're actually able to lengthen their telomeres. Um, so they measured the telomeres at baseline and then three months later. And then in the control group where they were eating, you know, a mostly standard American diet, um, their telomeres got 3% shorter, just over three months. And the most adherent subjects, um, you know, in terms of the plant-based diet, they had the most lengthening in their telomeres. So pretty cool. Um, just the fact that, you know, diet alone can make such a big difference on how we measure aging and the outcomes. So what exactly is the Ornish diet? Uh, basically, it is a plant-strong diet. It maximizes the intake of whole plant foods. It minimizes the intake of processed foods, you know, in boxes and bags with lots of ingredients and added oil and sugar in animal-derived foods. So it focuses on fruits, vegetables, unrefined grains like brown rice and quinoa, which we can argue is a seed and not a grain, um, oats, amaranth, millet, uh, whole wheat. So the types of grains that aren't necessarily uh, what we call, you know, refined grains like our white flour and enriched wheat flour that's not whole. Um, and even a lot of the gluten free stuff that's out there that's made with potato starch and all kinds of isolated ingredients. In legumes, you know, there's over 100 different types of beans alone. And then legumes would include things like peanuts and lentils. And then small amount of nuts and seeds. And then as we talked about, very low and refined um, carbohydrates and little to no animal protein. So that's basically what the Ornish diet that was used in the heart disease research, as well as in the telomere research. And this is sort of what it looks like. And these are pictures from, from food I've eaten. Um, so uh, in this one up here, I. There are so many good taco places here where I live in St. Petersburg, Florida. So this is just a um, whole corn tortilla filled with, they have this amazing cabbage slaw, this restaurant with beans and brown rice and guacamole and lemon slices, or excuse me, lime slices. And over here is a uh, yellow rice. Over here is a really yummy spicy salsa. salsa. Verde, and then of course, um, this is sort of like a guac bowl with uh, butternut squash and lots of greens. Over here is just like a standard 10 minute meal that I make when I'm in a rush. And it is just uh, brown rice noodles, steamed broccoli, throw in some uh, marinated tofu that I just marinate in you know, lime juice and a little soy sauce with some sesame seeds, and it's a quick 10 minute dinner. Here is just an example of a breakfast bowl over on the, uh, the lower uh, left hand with um, you know, some oats and bananas and strawberries. And uh, the base of that was just an acai base in the blender where I put in a package of acai and some spinach and maybe a little bit of almond butter and some um, soy milk or rice milk. And it's delicious. And then over to the right um, is an Indian dish uh, from a restaurant with naan and a little bit of coconut based yogurt um, with some cauliflower, curry cauliflower over some um, chickpeas. My niece and my husband are in the upper left hand corner and we're just enjoying breakfast out. And um, this is at a restaurant in Ann Arbor um, where my family lives, Ann Arbor, Michigan. So it's a tofu scramble with whole grain toast and potatoes. And you can see over here waffles. So plant-based diets are not about deficiency. They're about um, so many myriad of choices that we can consume. Upper right-hand corner is my friend's daughter who uh, is chopping vegetables for prepare food where we're cooking dinner together. Lower left is what I call nice cream in a blender. You just take some banana, frozen bananas, um, a little bit of cocoa powder, um, a little bit of your favorite nut butter and, and just a splash of plant-based milk and you have the, the, the most delicious tasting soft serve. And then another lazy dinner. I love to eat healthy, but 
to be honest, I hate to cook. <laughs> so I always find things that are very simple. Um, so this is a, a black bean burger, um, you know, piled high with avocado and all the fixins um, on a um, millet bun um, that I just got at the grocery store. So again, just wanted to show some examples of, of some plant-based foods that are um, delicious and really nourishing for the body. So again, our genes are not our destiny. So as we can see just US population, you know, the average person's life expectancy could increase by 10 to 12 years, just by adopting those blue zone lifestyles. So again, we focused a lot on diet, but it's not just diet. So remember, it's sort of a, um, a whole package. So again, it's about moving naturally. It's about having the right outlook on life, including knowing what your purpose is, and then also having the right people and surrounding yourselves with. Changing is difficult. And when we are trying to make lifestyle changes and we don't have the support of the people that we spend our time with, it's extremely challenging. It's extremely challenging because socially, what do we do to get together? We eat. And so it's really important that we at least try to surround ourselves with people that support our habits. They may not be eating like us, but it's so important that they support when we do want to make changes. You know, and our lifestyle lets us alter our genes and take control over our own health and our longevity. So I love this cartoon. So don't forget to turn back your clock. I'm turning back mine when I was 20. And maybe not 20 in my case, maybe, maybe 30. 20, too much going on in those early 20s. So I wanted to talk about some resources. I'm actually going to spend a bit of time here um, hashing each one. But the Blue Zones website has an amazing wealth of information, um, including a lot of the, uh, the recipes um, that are delicious. So they, they really have some great recipes on their website. They have a lot about the research on the different Blue Zones. Um, they put out uh, articles on a regular basis. Um, and just a, a myriad of topics. So again, just a great resource um, to take a look at to continue on with your education on this. The other thing is the Center for Nutrition Studies. Oops, excuse me. This is the company that I have worked for since 2012. So our guide is a fantastic resource to sort of kind of get you started on you know, where do I start? How do I start to consume or put more plants in my diet? So it's not about being vegan or vegetarian. It's just about adding more of these foods into your life. I actually hate the word vegan. You figure Twizzlers, Diet Coke, Oreos, those are all vegan. Vegan doesn't mean healthy. Um, whole plant foods, that's what we want to be adding more of into our diet. And we have like a plant-based shopping guide. Um, so that helps out in some success stories and articles. And then my favorite are our recipes. Um, we have a ton of recipes on our website um, to get people started. So I wanted to point out that uh, back in here. For those of you that are more interested in the science aspect of things outside of resources, nutritionfacts.org is a fantastic resource. So what this physician does, Dr. Greger, is every day he puts out a video of the day talking about the latest research. And so this is something you can subscribe to via email, um, or you can just go out on the site every day. Um, but they have so many fantastic topics. So these are just um, some of the most popular ones, uh, men's health, women's health, longevity, which is why I wanted to point that out. So when you click on the longevity section, he has a ton of research, uh, not only increasing our lifespan, um, but also really focusing on quality of life, which that's what it's about. Who wants to live to 100 if we feel lousy most of the time? Um, it's not about living longer necessarily, but again, about living a better quality of life. Books. Oops, excuse me. So How Not to Diet by that same physician, Dr. Michael Greger. Not only is it a great book, um, but it's also pretty funny as well. I actually just bought, I'm leaving, but I'm still talking. 
I just bought this cookbook, and I've been reading through it, and it's the How Not to Diet cookbook, and it's really good, and it's 100 recipes for healthy, permanent weight loss. Um, again, I don't necessarily focus on weight loss for myself, but usually healthy eating translates to an ideal weight, um, but there's so many good recipes in this one as well. The Campbell Plan by Dr. Thomas Campbell. Um, he is the medical director of the nonprofit that I work for, Undo It, as I spoke of before, by Dr. Dean Ornish, and then a couple other cookbooks that are uh, fantastic resources to get folks started. Next steps. So besides, obviously, some of the research and resources that I pointed out, there's a cool documentary from last year, and it's called Code Blue Doc. It's fantastic. Um, it really talks and hones in on, and it's um, American specific, but our healthcare system and more that we're a disease care system, um, talks about aging, uh, lifestyle, diet, um, our policies, just it's, it's a great documentary, highly suggest it. And then uh, the uh, Kaiser Permanente, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, it's our biggest hospital system in the United States. And collectively, because they have a unique situation where the insurance that they provide um, is also um, the treatment at their facilities, it is works to their best interest if they keep their members healthy. So unlike other places where healthcare is more of a business, this is, it works to their benefit to keep folks more preventative of disease as opposed to retroactively treating disease. So this is uh, their plant-based diet booklet um, that they give to, oops, I'm sorry. It must have been uh, a different link. I apologize for that. And I'll update that link. But Kaiser Permanente has a whole nutrition services and they have a whole um, booklet that is really informative. Um, it actually helps for, um, if you were trying to build more plants in your diet, but then also are helping um, to understand some of the science behind it and making sure that proper nutrients are given. It is just a wealth of knowledge. And again, I apologize for that link. Um, I can send an updated link to Tara uh, for that for you. But if you just um, Google Kaiser and plant-based diet, it's the first one that comes up in your search. And then again, the other thing that's so cool is Meatless Monday has sort of become mainstream. Uh, it's kind of neat. I, I love looking out on Instagram at the Meatless Monday hashtag just to kind of see some fun inspiration and what people are doing. And again, it's just a nice way, even if it's just one day a week where you're starting to add more fruits and vegetables into your diet, um, that can be a fantastic start. And then this is me at my desk. Um, so in this picture, I'm standing up on my wobble board, but you can see my bike um, next to it. And that's what um, I'm on right now to sort of um, get into that quadrant of moving more naturally. So um, again, here is my email address. If you had further questions or um, had questions about the resources, um, once we're done with the Q&A today, and I'm happy um, to respond. So, thank you so much. Thanks, Joe. Um, so we do have a number of questions. So um, one of the questions is, if you're over 60, can this still be effective? Oh, I love that question. That's my favorite. So in cardiac rehab, we generally, our average age was 72 years old. So we had folks into their 90s where we saw blockages uh, reversed. Um, and so and we saw vitality restored. Um, so this was something that we saw all the time. So yes, of course, after the 60s, so young um, and 65. So yeah, we saw changes, positive changes happening in, in over the 98 year old population. Okay. Um, also, uh, someone says that they've read that soy is terrible for you, cancer causing, unless it is fermented. What are, you, what are your thoughts on this? So with soy, um, that's actually a myth and a misnomer. So the studies that um, that statement is based off of are based off of an isolated soy protein. 
So our bodies don't like things in isolation. They don't like protein powders. They don't like added sugars. They don't like added fats. Our body does best when we're consuming whole foods. So when we're consuming isolated protein of anything, that really put, can take the body you know, out of whack, um, make it go awry. So the studies are based on very, 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 very high quantities of isolated soy protein. So if you put it in comparatively speaking, you'd have to drink five gallons of soy milk a day um, to match those protein um, quantities in those studies. So some of the longest lived population and healthiest populations are those that consume soy on a daily basis. So think of the Asian diet, um, primarily again, the Chinese and uh, Japanese diet, very, very you know, high amounts of soy, soy sauce and lowest rates of breast, ovarian and prostate cancer. But I have okay. a lot more research on that. So if that individual wants to email me, I have a lot of um, resources that I could, I could offer. Okay, um, so here's a few more questions. Uh, well, we have a number of them, but when you're saying 10% of protein in a diet, are you only talking about meat or is it that protein in general and from other sources? Great, great question. It's actually protein in general. So again, it's not necessarily, we're not talking about grams. We're just talking about 8% of your total calories, um, you know, in, in your diet. So, and again, that's, uh, if you're consuming uh, predominantly a plant-based diet and you're consuming maybe uh, a deck of cards, just like we were talking about worth of animal protein, you know, a week, um, that's gonna give you your ideal protein amount. In the States, um, we are averaging about 17% protein and that really puts a lot of strain on our kidneys and uh, creates an inflammatory response in the body. Okay. Um, Plant-based milk. How does that measure up? Is it processed to some extent, but grains are as well? Sure. So with plant-based milk, you always have to read the ingredients. Um, there are some that are better than others. A lot of them have added gums, uh, emulsifiers, added sugar, added oil. Um, and so those are the ones you want to stay away from. So, you know, when we break something down into a liquid form, yeah, it's a little bit processed, but again, it's still a whole food source. Um, so my two favorite milks are Eden Bran and West Soy, because th there's just two ingredients, organic soybeans and filtered water. And then the other one that I love is um, hemp milk. Hemp milk tends to not need gums associated with it, and it's very high in omega-3, and it's high in protein, just like soy is. Um, there are a few almond milk as well, but I bought something, it's called an almond cow. And it's just this cool machine, it wasn't that expensive. And you just stick in like cashews, a little bit of vanilla extract, maybe a tad of sea salt um, and some, you know, and some dates. And then it turns it into this like most delicious creamiest milk. Um, it's, it's, it's the coolest thing and it's called the almond cow. So again, that's taking whole foods and making plant-based milk out of it without any added junk. Okay, um, so I agree with the first part of this um, question, but not the latter. You shared some, um, how smoking ages. How does alcohol affect age? I know alcohol, <laughs> but you mentioned that. So I, I, I um, as my husband and I say, we gave up the sauce on uh, the new year. <laughs> so it's, it's been 12 days in. We do this every January, no booze January. Um, and you know, I, I do feel better and we always say, damn. Um, but no, so again, there's some conflicting research. Um, one thing actually in common with the blue zones is that they do consume red wine. Um, but the wine is a non-preservative old world wine. Again, when you're talking about patterns and again, they're not drinking a lot of it. It really, it's the equivalent of about four ounces a day. So that's mm -hmm. not a lot of wine. Um, but what's neat about that is that it's not necessarily, again, what they're trying to pinpoint is, yeah, it might be that small amount of wine in moderation, but it's how they're consuming it. And we talked about that population that does the three hour happy hour. So they're consuming wine with friends, with their tribe um, in a very social setting. Um, they're not doing it alone, you know, scrolling through, swiping through Facebook. Um, it's a very social setting. Okay, and this is a good question. Can you explain the difference between veggies and legumes? Yes, um, so legumes are um, all of your beans. So black beans, pinto, aduki, okay. black-eyed peas, chickpeas. 
Uh, so those are all your legumes and then including lentils as well in that. And peanuts are actually all legumes. So mm -hmm. your vegetables are just what you may think of as your vegetables. So, you know, your, your carrots and your leafy greens and cauliflower and broccoli, um, et cetera. And tomato can fall in other category depending on which side of the fence you're on, fruit or vegetable. Right, right. Okay, uh, another question is, does protein restriction apply to both meat-based and plant-based protein? Yeah, so what we find is that um, the protein that is from an animal source has the most negative impact on us. So, and it's very difficult to overconsume protein from a whole plant-based source. The right. only exception would be is if we're having these isolated plant-based protein powders that we're consuming. We just, we don't need them. Again, our body doesn't like these macronutrients in isolation. It likes whole foods. So in, if you're having a smoothie, instead of adding protein powder, add some flaxseed or use soy or hemp milk, which are extremely high in protein, or add a little bit of nut butter. Um, these things all, uh, the body likes, uh, incorporates it better into our system. That was good. Um, this is a good question because I myself have, um, I'll just read the question. <laughs> there are so many great tasting meat substitutions out there now, like obviously beyond meat, that they are also soy and gluten free, but are those really healthy or are they too processed such that the plant-based benefits get compromised. I like Beyond Burgers, but is that- I do too. Okay. Yeah, I like Beyond Burgers. I like some of the new substitutes out there. Beyond Sausages, like I did stuffed peppers with some Beyond Sausage, mm. but it is more of a treat um, because they do have a lot of added oil and they're not necessarily whole food ingredients. You know, that's something that you wanna consume in moderation. Are they better than animal protein? Generally speaking, yes, they have less sodium. They generally have um, less saturated fat in them. So it's a spectrum, you know, and it, uh, what we always, you know, what's helpful is they can be um, transition foods as well, but nothing's wrong with consuming them in, in moderation. Okay. Now, can the um, Ornish diet or plant-based diet help women in menopause and menopause symptoms? Yes. So there's actually a lot of research to show that consuming more plants helps with fibroids, helps with endometriosis, um, it helps with perimenopause, um, and helps to stabilize hormones as women are going through um, is going through menopause. Okay. Um, and one of the questions is, um, you did not mention organic products. What is your advice regarding selecting organic vegetables and foods? I feel like that's a follow-up lecture because it's so much, that's such a loaded question. It has so many different variables that go into that. So again, think of, if you just think simplicity, you know, what, what is our body intended to consume? Um, not pesticides, um, not food that's grown in non-fertile soil that has a lot of inputs that aren't necessarily good for our body. Um, so when we can, include organic foods um, from a price point, those are always gonna be best. And local small farmers, sometimes that don't have that organic certification are gonna be better for us than, you know, a store-bought, you know, produce that had to travel, you know, miles and miles, hundreds of miles away. So again, the biggest thing is plant-based foods and then kind of thinking, you know, let's, let's get out the inputs that aren't necessarily meant for us. Okay, so someone says that they have a, pro a vegan protein shake almost every night and it sounds like they should stop. Um, with that said, any recommendation, recommendations on, um, on a satisfying snack an hour or two before bedtime? That's a good question because I do intermittent fasting, but I feel like I'm always hungry at six and after. So ideally, we should uh, not be eating past, so the research is showing that we shouldn't eat past 7 p.m. And then you wanna wait 12 hours before your next meal. So it's never uh, a good idea to eat an hour or two before bedtime. Um, again, sleep is meant to repair the body. And when the body is using its resources for digestion, we don't repair as readily. So I have suffered from rheumatoid arthritis for years and I'm no longer on any type of medication because I consume a, a plant-based diet. Um, and I say that because I was, uh, I added a lot more plant-based foods into my diet years ago, but wasn't fasting. I was eating right before I went to bed and then I would eat right when I woke up. 
and when I started to incorporate the intermittent fasting, that was sort of what took me over in a good way. Um, that I my pain was really well tolerated. So, so yeah, we just so want to. Yeah, so 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., that's sort of the window that research shows. So should, should this person continue with the vegan protein shake? Oh, so on the protein shake topic. So again, uh, nothing's wrong with smoothies. I have them almost every day. Um, so with a smoothie, though, you want to incorporate whole food ingredients. So instead of that protein powder, um, you don't need to spend your money on that. Again, um, two tablespoons of ground flaxseed are a great supplement to your smoothie or nut butter, um, whether that's almond or peanut or cashew or sun butter. Um, and again, using a, um, a, a soy milk, it's an organic soy milk, um, that's also very high in protein. And then remember, every food has protein. So, you know, even, even a banana is 10% protein. So we, we, again, we don't need to worry about protein deficiency in this country, we need to worry about fiber deficiency. All right, um, somebody else wanted to know um, if they want to incorporate more fruits, should they focus on fruits with seeds only for the most benefit? So we'll just kiss, keep it simple. It's just fruit is, is great. And the biggest thing for everyone is just the variety. Um, there's no magic superfood. Um, you know, it's not like we're gonna, you know, look like we're 20 years old if we have acai and sweet potatoes. I mean, those are great foods, um, but the variety is what's key because we don't want to just be consuming, you know, the same exact five foods every day. Um, and so that's when we were incorporating more whole plants into the diet. Um, the amount of options are endless as opposed to if we're really focusing um, on just meat-based diet, we only have pretty much like five things to choose from. So yeah, more plants, um, you know, less animal-derived foods. Okay. Now, do you, um, can you recommend foods that combat wrinkles? That's so funny. I was just having this conversation with um, an esthetician friend of, my, of, of mine. So yeah, so any type of inflammatory response is going to come out in your skin. So if anyone knows a long, um, you know, lifetime smoker, my dad, who looks like a raisin, um, you know, that type of thing um, ages the skin. So anything that ages you internally is going to age you externally. Um, so I'm 47, you know, knock on wood, my skin's been pretty good. Um, I've been eating a plant forward diet since about 1998 a long time ago, and then um, a whole foods plant-based diet for 10 years. And I do notice a difference in my skin. Um, so, and I do notice a difference just, um, you know, c comparatively, so. Okay, um, and I have two more questions. One came in, um, well, it's gonna be two things. So let me read this one. Um, but this person is curious on how um, both Canada and the US rank so low for safety during childbirth. It was on page four, especially considering the steep cost of childbirth here in the U.S., and that they notice how the presentation revolves around avoiding meat, um, as there can be consequences with a plant-based diet for those who don't reach out, who don't research properly or consult a physician. Um, so maybe page 15 could include a protein like chicken breast or skinless or bake as a healthy alternative as um, to show the age. Um, it just seems that there's a lot of fatty and processed proteins um, when there are so many leaner and cleaner alternatives. Yeah, so again, it's not about, you know, you don't necessarily have to be 100% plant-based, but it's just when we talk about antioxidants and things that are anti-aging, those are in plant-based foods. There's very little antioxidant um, in animal-derived foods. So again, when we look at epidemiological studies, uh, when we look at the blue zones, they consume very little animal protein. Um, so again, it's not that you need to consume none, um, but that's what's seen about the spectrum. So the more plants you consume, the better off. So is like a lean piece of chicken better than like a processed plant-based meal? Again, that's full of vegan foods that aren't healthy? Yeah, probably. Um, so again, it's about eating clean and mostly plant-based. So to the childbirth question for Canada mm -hmm. and the US, so the US and Canada tend to do more cesareans. So with that, there tends to be more issues with child safety as it pertains to birth. So. Got it. Well, I don't have to worry about that anytime soon, but anyway. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. Can you explain intermittent fasting? Yes. 
So again, this there's a couple different versions, but basically yes. intermittent fasting means that you're not doing like a two day fast. Um, and, and the most, uh, I guess, basic form of intermittent fasting is waiting 12 to 14 hours in between your dinner and your breakfast. So that's sort of like the baseline one, what I do. I don't do any big fasts or juice cleanses. I just sort of work on intermittent fasting um, most days of the week. You know, if I have dinner reservations on a Saturday at 7.30, you know, I'm not too worried about that. But for the most part during the week, I try not to eat before 7 p.m. There is... Um, a lot of good research on intermittent fasting. And for that person that asked that question, um, feel free to email me and I can um, direct you to some intermittent fasting um, plans and, and some research on how to get started with that. Sounds good. Um, anyone else have any more questions before we sadly have to uh, let Jill go? I just wanted to uh, make sure we have a few more minutes. Um, and I, oh. Somebody did have a question that just came in. Let's just see really quickly what that one is. Oh, um, your thoughts on juicing. Ooh, good question. So again, I'm not against juicing as long as that juice um, is something that's not like a Tropicana, which is in my neighborhood. Um, you know, that's very processed. Um, it's not a whole food, remember? So juicing does have its place, um, especially as it pertains, there's a lot of research with green juicing. Um, so pre predominantly vegetable juicing um, and cancer outcomes uh, and helping boost the immune system. So again, you just wanna be careful. We're talking about juicing. We're not necessarily talking about like a juice you would buy at the grocery store in a container. Um, so it does have its place, um, but that's not something that we should always be consuming because again, it's not a whole food, um, but a good, a lot of research to show short-term um, juicing or, or juices every once in a while can be advantageous. Okay. Well, thank you, Jill, so much for taking time to educate us on the ways we can live longer. Um, I have hope. Um, so, and if you would like to see the webinar again, please visit our website at www.beconet.com slash flourish under the green room. It'll be available along with some previous webinars and we hope you will continue joining us with some other webinars we have coming up in series. I um, mean, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you.